Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Daniel Call, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity titled CMV Prophylaxis in Kidney Transplant, Examining New Solutions to an Old Problem. Today's program is supported by an independent medical educational grant from Merck Sharp and Dome Corporation, a subsidiary of Merck and Company. So to introduce myself further, I'm the Director of Transplant Infectious Diseases at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and the Director of our Infectious Disease Training Program. I'm very pleased uh, to be joined today by an excellent panel who I'll ask to introduce themselves now. Uh, I'm uh, Roy Bloom. I am um, a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Promise School of Medicine. I'm the medical director of our kidney and pancreas transplant program as well uh, at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm Margaret Jorgensen. Um, I'm a clinical pharmacist in abdominal solid organ transplant at UW Health in Madison, Wisconsin, and the program lead and creator of our CMV antiviral stewardship program. Great, thank you. So before starting our program, I want to express um, you know, my excitement at how unique an opportunity is to be on this panel. We, uh, the three of us represent different backgrounds, different roles in different institutions. Um, and really we look at the topics being discussed today in a different way. And we know that everyone may do things a little bit differently uh, based on the capabilities of their centers, um, their immunosuppression protocols, and other factors when it comes to CMV prophylaxis. So we really hope that this discussion can help provide you with a well-rounded uh, perspective when it comes to CMV prevention and provide you with something unique to take back to your practice, no matter what role you work in. That's being said, uh, let's look at our first uh, objective of the day, which is to identify the current implications of CMB infection in kidney transplant uh, recipients. And we'll start with Dr. Jorgensen um, by taking a little time to tell us why C what CMV is and why it matters in practice. So Dr. Jorgensen, could you start talking about the, the subject? Yes, thanks Dr. Call. Um, so cytomegalovirus or CMV is a ubiquitous herpes virus that causes primary infection followed by lifelong latency. So it's important to know that we're going to talk about a lot of antivirals and, you know, prophylaxis treatment, but there is no cure for this virus um, beyond, you know, the host immune system ability to maintain uh, the virus in latency. So it's quite prevalent in North America. 50% uh, of adults are infected by the age of 40. Um, but most of the time you get infected in childhood and really you don't even know you got CMV tends to be asymptomatic in um, immunocompetent people. However, in the setting of immunosuppression, like after a transplant, it can have severe manifestations. So Dr. Jorgensen, we know CMV is a virus that can cause these complications as, as you mentioned in immunosuppressed patients. Could you drill down on that a little bit and tell us what these complications tend to look like? Definitely. And I think, you know, we should probably review a little bit of the nomenclature before we get any further into it. So um, we'll refer to something called primary infection. So this would be an infection that occurs in a seronegative patient or someone who was never exposed to the CMV virus before transplant. And now after transplant, they're having, you know, their first ever infection. We'll also talk about reactivation, which is recurrent viral um, seeding of the blood uh, in a patient who had been exposed to CMV prior to transplant and should have pre-existing immunity. We also, when talking about CMV disease, classify these into two separate categories. So there's CMV infection, which really just refers to viral replication in blood and tissues, irrespective of symptoms. And then there's CMV disease, which could either be viral replication or end organ manifestations in the presence of symptoms. So the most common symptoms are fever, malaise, and leukopenia, and this is referred to as CMV syndrome in the presence of viral replication. 
There can also be end organ manifestations, most commonly to the GI tract, CMV colitis, gastritis, or esophagitis. The CMV virus also tends to have a predilection for allograft tissue. So if you've had a liver transplant, you're more likely to have CMV hepatitis with elevated LFTs. Um, if you've had a lung transplant, you're more likely to have CMV pneumonitis and so forth. Great, thanks uh, so much for that uh, discussion. And let's take a second here for uh, an audience res response question. And the question is, which patient population of the ones you see listed below uh, is at the highest risk for CMV uh, infection? Please go ahead and vote, and then we'll discuss uh, your results in just a minute. Great. Uh, thanks. So, Dr. Jorgensen, maybe we could just kind of discuss as it relates to that question, you know, serostatus and level of, of risk. Yeah, that sounds good. So, risk of CMV is evaluated based on serologies done at time of transplant. So, this would be, had you been exposed to the virus before transplant or not? So the lowest risk patients are seronegative recipients. So they were never exposed to CMV prior to transplant and neither was their donor. So there's no CMV in that picture. Um, we anticipate that they won't have CMV disease. Of course, they still could be exposed in the community. Moderate risk are seropositive recipients. So this is a transplant recipient who previously was exposed to CMV prior to transplant should have pre-existing immunity, um, and then their donor may or may not have been exposed. But the highest risk are these seronegative recipients. So they've never been exposed to CMV, they have no pre-existing immunity, and then they receive an allograph from a seropositive donor. So in the allograph is latent virus, and we essentially know that we're giving these patients who have no pre-existing immunity the CMV virus. The reason Great. that and, it, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please go ahead. I was going to say the reason why it's important to evaluate risk at transplant is because despite the presence of these potent antivirals that we'll discuss later in the presentation, um, CMV disease still has pretty significant effects on uh, the graft survival. So, you know, it's associated with rejection. Um, in this study, it is also associated with increased length of hospital stay, hospital readmission, and increased costs. So despite having these drugs to treat it, it still, you know, is a problem in this modern day. Great. So fair to say CMV is bad. <laughs> Agreed. All right. I think we can all agree on that one. All right. So let's move back to our original audience response question and see what we learned to the answer this question. Which patient population is at the highest risk for CMV infection? Okay, so uh, what we see, so there's pre and post, and as Dr. Jorgensen explained, the highest risk is donor positive, recipient negative. So folks, as as you stated, who are, uh, we're giving them a good thing in the organ and often a bad thing in the CMV. Uh, and so uh, you can see there was, uh, you communicated that very well, because we went from 29% uh, pre to 74% uh, uh, post. So let's uh, move on now to objective number two. And thank you so much, Dr. Jorgensen, for a great start to the, the program. In this section, we'll turn to the second objective, which is to develop an evidence-based individualized plan to optimize CMV 
prevention for kidney transplant uh, recipients. So we'll move to Dr. Bloom. Um, and Dr. Bloom, really to understand CMV uh, prevention, we have to be familiar with the strategies avail uh, that are commonly used, meaning either preemptive therapy or universal prophylaxis. And Dr. Bloom, can you introduce us to those concepts? Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dan. So, um, yeah, of the two strategies, uh, they are is either the preemptive approach or PET. Uh, what this entails is weekly CMV um, nucleic acid testing monitoring for at least 12 weeks following the transplant. And then once a predetermined viral assay threshold is crossed, antiviral therapy has begun. Now, there's no current universal threshold that's defined for this. Um, different sort of thresholds have been published, often around 1,000, um, but uh, that remains to be standardized on a, a universal basis. The, besides uh, the preemptive approach, there's also universal prophylaxis. And in this uh, context, prophylaxis is usually given within 10 days post-transplant. The duration of the prophylaxis varies. It depends on the serostatus of the donor and recipient. Um, so, for example, patients that are considered higher risk would get a longer course of it, whereas uh, patients that are lower risk would get a shorter course of, of CMV prophylaxis. And even for the negative, seronegative to negative donor and recipient pairs, they may not even need CMV uh, prophylaxis per se. Um, so just to compare prophylaxis versus preemptive therapy in terms of the pros and cons or benefits and, and, and advantages and disadvantages, um, using a prophylactic approach, you're, you're treating a whole population. So uh, it's very uncommon or rare that you'll see CMV breakthrough. And so um, you don't usually see early CMV. On the other hand, with preemptive therapy, you will anticipate getting a lot of uh, uh, early CMV that you will then uh, take an approach with preemptively treating. Uh, regardless, both approaches um, are quite effective uh, at um, reducing and, or preventing CMV disease. Um, late CMV, because you're prophylaxing during the early phase, is much more common with a prophylactic approach, whereas preemptive therapy, most of patients who will develop CMV will develop it during that period, and so late CMV is less common. Uh, resistance is uncommon with both approaches. Clearly, a prophylactic approach uh, is easier to implement. So I work in a large transplant center where we transplant almost 300 kidneys a year. And for us, it's much easier to just say for everybody, we're going to use um, uh, uh, prophylaxis. Uh, it would be much, it would be challenging for us to implement um, a preemptive approach. But certainly in a smaller scale program, or if you have the resources, I think it's a reasonable alternative. Uh, prophylactic therapy, at least with valgancyclovir, will prevent uh, herpes and uh, varicella virus, whereas obviously if you're not using any, any uh, prophylaxis, you are going to need to still uh, consider having some kind of preventive therapy for these two viruses. Other opportunistic infections are prevented by prophylaxis. The data is less common in preemptive approaches. Um, the cost of the drug, obviously, if you're treating everyone with prophylaxis, you're going to assume that everybody will, that, that that cost has to be borne, whereas with preemptive, you're only paying or covering the monitoring costs uh, and, and patients who need to be treated. Overall, if you compare costs between the two approaches, uh, there is the, uh, data suggesting that is, uh, if you account for everything, including developing CMV disease, there may not be a huge difference between the two approaches. Uh, safety is always a consideration, side effects from using prophylaxis, whereas if you limit it to preemptive, it'll be much less toxicity. Um, prophylaxis may prevent rejection, whereas this is largely unknown with uh, preemptive therapy, and graft survival um, has not been shown to really differ between the two approaches, uh, but as long as you treat CMV, there is a general improvement. So bottom line is with screening for CMV, using a preemptive approach, um, the 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 more the less frequently you screen, the higher the rates of CMV, and the more likely that you have inferior graft survival versus universal prophylaxis. Um, this is just a recently published study uh, that compared a prophylactic and preemptive approach. It was a study from a single center in Europe, uh, a randomized controlled trial, open label. 
um, uh, included patients who are uh, either recipient seropositive or donor positive recipient negative. Uh, over the primary endpoint was the incidence of acute rejection. It was no, there was no significant difference um, <clears throat> at the end of one year post transplant. Uh, subclinical rejection, however, on a protocol biopsy at three months was a little more uh, common or, or, or likely in the preemptive group. It was reduced by prophylaxis. Uh, um, a preemptive therapy had higher rates of CMV DNAemia, which is not surprising. Um, but overall, um, both strategies prevented CMV disease. By the same token, uh, preemptive therapy was associated with a lower rate of uh, neutropenia. Dr. Bloom, I've uh, got a couple of questions from the audience related to what you're talking about. Um, and I don't know if you'll have an exact number for this, but the question is, you know, what's kind of the cost for monitoring, you know, if you know what that assay costs, at least in, in your center? Honestly, I don't. Um, that's a I can make a guess if you want. I, yeah, I think well, it's uh, probably... Go ahead. I was going to say, it's probably going to be a couple hundred dollars, something like that. You know, it, it, obviously what people bill and what they're actually able to collect can always vary, but that'd be my guess for a CMV PCR, but I could be uh, uh, off a little bit. And then one other uh, question, if there's no universal threshold for uh, preemptive treatment, how would we determine what the threshold should be? So, I mean, that points out one of the major problems. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So the study that I just showed you, for example, in that trial, they used a threshold of 1,000. Um, they did whole blood monitoring, but they used the threshold of 1,000 as their um, point of, of initiating uh, therapy in the preemptive group. Um, we, in my center, do uh, uh, prophylaxis, but um, what we do when patients, let's say post-prophylaxis, um, when they become viremic, um, then we still, our own practice is to use a thousand for initiating treatment, even post prophylaxis. So, again, that's is, that's giving you the experience of this trial in my own center. That's two centers, but I think as I think that's a reasonable start. But I think that's a good point in terms of uh, um, knowledge gap or, or unmet needs in terms of understanding what that threshold should be. Yeah, and I'll just mention because there's no set thing for donor positive recipient negative if i'm in a preemptive strategy when i see viremia then i'll start to treat it because those folks don't have immunity if they're still in the prophylactic period well thank you dr bloom for your discussion on prophylaxis and preemptive therapy there are some other questions on this that we'll get to in the question and answer therapy as well but i think it painted a great picture as to the two uh different methods so dr jorgensen the rest of the learning objective um, we'll focus on some of the specific therapies used for CMV uh, prevention, uh, particularly in the universal prophylaxis theory, uh, universal prophylaxis uh, scenario. Um, but before we have you go through and discuss those, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about really what the end goal is of CMV prevention and all of these different strategies. Yes, thank you, Dr. Call. I agree. Um, before I get too into the weeds with drugs, because you know, as a pharmacist, we just love talking about medicine. I just want to remind everyone that this, there is no cure. The only way the patient develops freedom for life from antivirals is to develop cell mediated immunity. So we want to create an environment that's conducive to cell mediated immunity. And the antivirals are really just our tools to help the transplant recipient get to this. So <clears throat> historically, and you know, currently, the gold standard antiviral for treatment and prophylaxis is gancyclovir and its oral prodrug, valgancyclovir. These drugs were great. They really revolutionized, you know, the immediate post-transplant period and the treatment of CMV. However, unfortunately, um, they do have a pretty potent toxicity, which is this neutropenia and leukopenia we've been talking about a little bit so far. So in this retrospective study of 363 mixed allograft subtype transplant recipients, where they compared patients who received valgancyclovir prophylaxis to those CMV donor negative, recipient negative, 
uh, patients who would have received just acyclovir. They found those that got valgancyclovir had significantly more new onset leukopenia, neutropenia, and required a lot more GCSF to support them. And, I, you know, this myelosuppression is associated with a significant burden, um, you know, mostly in as much as if you have a low white blood cell count and you're requiring GCSF, um, you may turn to reducing immunosuppression. So many times, you know, especially in the high risk subset, um, you wouldn't want to reduce the dose of your universal prophylaxis, the valgan cyclovir, because that's associated with resistance. So instead, you turn to the mycophenolate because that is certainly um, a key side effect of that medication as well. And then any mycophenolate reduction in the first year is associated with acute rejection. So, you know, it's not the best option to deal with that toxicity. Yeah, that'll be a great discussion topic. So um, thanks for that uh, uh, discussion uh, about kind of the rock and the hard place that we get in this situation. But we have another opportunity for an for the audience to participate with a, a response question. So the question is, which of the following is used for CMV prevention in high risk? So donor positive, recipient negative, as we discussed before, adult kidney transplants recipients, and is also associated with lower risk of leukopenia and neutropenia. Uh, so please go ahead and vote now. And as we did before, we'll talk about uh, your results uh, a little bit later in the presentation. All right, well, while you're thinking about your answer to that question, um, I also wanted to present this novel antiviral agent. So Latirmavir was FDA approved for uh, prevention of CMV and high-risk kidney transplant recipients on June 6th of this year. Um, while this medication, you know, is similar to Valgan cyclovir, it's available orally, um, dose doesn't have to be adjusted for renal function. Um, there are some important drug interactions that we'll talk about later towards the end of the presentation. Um, and important to note also, this medication has a much more narrow antiviral um, therapeutic index. So it doesn't cover, you know, HSV and VZV like valgancyclovir would. But in the phase three trial, um, where they compared valgancyclovir to latirmavir along with acyclovir, they found looking at a primary efficacy outcome of CMV disease through the first post-transplant year and a safety outcome that was a co composite of leukopenia and neutropenia measured a number of different ways, they found that Latirmavir had a lower risk of these drug-related adverse events. So overall, there were significantly lower levels of leukopenia and neutropenia, and also it met its non-inferiority criteria. So latirmavir was no different in efficacy as valgancyclovir, preventing CMV replication in the high-risk um, CMV subset with improved tolerance. Great, thank you. So let's move back to our original audience response question and see what we learned. So to remind you, the question was, uh, which of the following is used for CMV prevention in high-risk adult kidney transplant recipients and is associated with lower risk of leukopenia and neutropenia? So you can see uh, the results here, um, and uh, the answer is A, latermavir. Uh, Meribavir is a drug uh, that is approved for treatment of resistant or refractory CMV, but does not have any uh, approval for prevention. 
Famcyclovir is a drug that's sort of similar to valacyclovir, acyclovir that does not have activity uh, against uh, CMV or not significant activity. And the same is true of acyclovir, some, some activity, but not some that really would be that useful for um, CMV uh, prevention. Um, and any uh, other comments, Dr. Jorgensen and Dr. Bloom, uh, about this? Not I'm currently. Not. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I guess to me, what was uh, striking here with the uh, approval of this drug, I wasn't at all surprised that it didn't cause leukopenia because we've been using it since 2017 in stem cell transplant patients for uh, uh, prevention. Um, but that that the efficacy was quite good and there was no emergence of resistance, which was my major concern prior to this trial, not so much the lack of side effects because we uh, had already, drug had been approved and we were aware of that. Okay, so- well, that I um, thought was kind of interesting about it was there was some initial hope that because it doesn't cause such severe leukopenia and maybe you know doesn't suppress replication as well, that- during the six month prophylaxis, patients would have some like subclinical replication that then would result in development of CMI. But the fact that it's completely non inferior, that means in those high risk patients, post prophylactic CMV is still going to occur. So you still need to be aware that just like when you stop valgancyclovir, when you stop latirmavir, it doesn't actually provide any additional benefit in that sense. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great point. We can it, the 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 main advantage is clearly the lack of toxicity with a trade off, perhaps of some drug interactions to deal with, but things that we're relatively used to dealing with. All right, so let's move on to our last learning objective of the program, which is really about implementing an interprofessional team approach, including institutional policies or protocols to support optimal use of CMV prophylaxis therapies. Um, and for this last objective, we plan on having discussions on different topics uh, that really shape the protocols associated with our specific institutions. And we know that all institutions are gonna be different uh, and may have be in different stages of thinking about their protocols since the uh, approval of latermavir for this indication. So I hope our discussion can provide some benefit to those who are in that process. And we're all on this panel in different uh, stages of that process. So let's begin um, by talking about best practices for laboratories. Um, and uh, the issues are challenges in getting timely labs. And I think a lot of this would be around doing a preemptive uh, strategy? Um, and is this really realistic for your institution? And then how often and for how long do we order labs? Maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. Bloom. You mentioned earlier, large institution might be difficult, but maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. So um, we're a large institution. We have patients, you know, we, that we, we get patients from, you know, a radius of hundreds of miles from our center. And so um, you know, in, in generally in managing these complications like CMV, we would like to have standardized lab. We're knowing that it's a, you know, a plasma level and that um, it's in a lab that we understand and know the virology well. Um, so I think, you know, to have patients going to a local hospital where they send it out to an, a, a commercial lab and it could take days or, or, or weeks, not weeks, but several days to come back. In our own center, we can usually get this done within uh, 24 hours at the longest. So um, I think that's an issue, you know, that is difficult. Most of our patients on a longer term basis beyond the first month are not coming back and forth to the transplant center to do their, uh, their longitudinal labs. Um, preemptive therapy is therefore a little bit, as I mentioned, it's more challenging. Um, where we have done it, so where we've had to resort to, say, for cost purposes, because patients have not been able to have adequate insurance coverage to, um, to cover the costs of uh, uh, prophylaxis, where we've used preemptive therapy, we generally use it for the duration that would 
we'd be doing prophylaxis. So for example, if it was, if it was an indication for 12 weeks of prophylaxis, then we'd, we'd screen patients for that long with a preemptive approach. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Jorgensen, uh, your thoughts about uh, some of those issues? Yeah, so this is an issue near and dear to my heart because we have a very rural and geographically dispersed population here in Wisconsin. I mean, we're talking UP, Michigan, Minnesota, sometimes like as far away as Florida, the West Coast. And, um, you know, even well, at my center, we do surveillance in the high risk population after universal prophylaxis. So that would be considered a hybrid approach where you give universal prophylaxis with a drug for a set period of time and then convert to sort of a preemptive approach thereafter um, because of our very high rates of CFV we were seeing in the high risk population. So, so whether they're near or far, if they're high risk, they're required to get these labs and we spend the majority of our time in the CMV stewardship program calling labs requesting labs, calling patients, and really if there was some way to like ensure that the lab would really draw it. You think that it's the patient or, you know, some communication error, but like the lab will have the orders. The patient will get the draw. The patient will say, please, will you draw my CMV? Because we call them and tell them to say that. And still they don't run it. So it is very uh, resource intensive. And then you know, in a high risk patient, if you were to miss two laboratories in a row, um, so you have a three week gap, the patient can present with viral loads greater than 10,000 due to their rapidly, you know, rapid replication rates. Um, so it is, it is definitely a challenge. I mean, we love preemptive monitoring. It really is avoiding antivirals and encouraging CMI, but, but, you know, there is a challenge to it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I agree with both of you. I love the idea of it, and we know that it's been demonstrated in a clinical trial setting, at least in liver transplant patients, to result in less CMV disease over a year and better um, cell mediated immunity. And that's obviously the cause of less CMV disease. But implementing it, getting the lab, the right lab drawn, the result communicated, and action taken on that result, the medication obtained and started, is just it's a huge. Um, it's a huge challenge um, for preemptive monitoring, particularly in larger programs. Great, so let's move on to the next uh, discussion point, which has to do with different serostatus groups uh, and the choice of therapy, whether they're high risk, so the donor positive, recipient negative, moderate risk, which is recipient positive, regardless of uh, donor status, and then, um, the category that sometimes scares me the most is the low risk who are uh, negative, negative. Um, uh, and I, Dr. Bloom, do you have any comments about uh, uh, the choice of therapy in these different groups? So we typically use um, for, we, we typically use prophylaxis for six months in the high risk group, three months in the moderate risk, and then in the low risk group we um, we just use uh, ASI or, or valacyclovir there um, to for herpes and uh, for herpes prophylaxis. Um, up until now, we've largely been using valgancyclovir. Um, we've used the term of in a few patients. Um, I know there's a question in the chat about valacyclovir. We've used that on very few occasions. Again, usually related to to insurance and co-pays for patients. Uh, the main issue there, I think, is the is the pull burden. Uh, you know, with uh, with with uh, the valacyclovir. But we typically have been using valgancyclovir dose for kidney function. Great, thanks. And I don't want to be cryptic there. When I said the the don't the low risk scare me the most because low risk shouldn't scare you. The reason it scares me is because every year I get uh, a person where, and this is a known problem, where the serology on the donor is incorrectly negative. They just have cleared their antibody or had it a long time ago or a technical problem with the test. And then this person is unprotected. And actually, Dr. Jorgensen, I thank you. You you fixed this problem for us because we're going to start doing CMV PCRs and all these people at about three or four weeks so that we don't uh, miss this problem. So I appreciate that. Um, uh, also, and, that yeah. Sometimes donors get transfused that we don't realize and they could be transfused 
even if they, they were naive, they get transfused with uh, CMV tainted blood. Yeah, and there are studies that do CMI assays in people who are seronegative and are positive, which shows that they had CMV before. It's actually a more potentially more sensitive test, or at least it picks up a different population. Um, yeah, and I think uh, I'll just mention in, in our center, we're very similar to where you are, uh, Dr. Bloom, which is we do the six months in the high risk. And even if they get induction immunosuppression with something like thymoglobulin, we still do three months in the recipient positive and just something for herpes simplex and, and varicella uh, zoster in the low risk, like acyclovir 200 twice a day or Valtrex. Um, uh, and we're also use latermavir right now. We're sort of moving into it um, in patients in whom uh, there are problems associated with uh, Valgan cyclovir, which we'll be talking about later. Dr. Jorgensen, I know you are in a different uh, place ahead of us, probably. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're doing. Yeah, so um, yes, definitely screening surveillance PCR. Can't recommend it enough. It just takes the edge off on those nag nag. You have a single misclassification and oh, you pay for that for one to two years even to get them to clear it. And then the outcomes are terrible. So yes, three-week PCR at their surgical follow-up and you're set. But um, yeah, so at my center, it was the same. We gave six months of Valgan cyclovir to high risk and we gave six months of Valgan cyclovir to moderate risk if they you know, had lymphocyte depletion and everybody got quite leukopenic and it was horrible. And then we had to pull them off of it and put them on preemptive monitoring. And we already talked about all the troubles with that. So um, early on, we were using latirmavir as a secondary prophylaxis agent, which of course is off label. Um, so we had some familiarity with it and uh, we're like, this is great. I mean, no leukopenia, you don't need preemptive monitoring. And you know, with the stewardship program, anything that makes our job easier, like not doing preemptive monitoring is good. So we were really aggressive with um, updating our protocols when it was FDA approved to make latirmavir our workhorse agent. So all patients of all zero status, besides, of course, low risk, who still get a cyclovir, will get latirmavir um, on post-op day one. Uh, you have to be cognizant of the drug interaction with tacrolimus. So it was very important to start it while they're inpatient after their transplant uh, to account for, you know, the effects it'll have on their tacrolimus. And then we continue it for six months per our original protocol. We, it is challenging to um, obtain it through insurance. Uh, you have to be really proactive. We're doing test claims, you know, while they're in the operating room. Um, Everyone requires a prior authorization. Um, many people require an appeal. And, you know, in the high risk group, we do everything possible to get that patient on latirmavir because we want to preserve the lymphocytes, you know, for their surveillance phase when we have about 50% have a replication event. So in exchange for all the work you pin in up front and early, then you don't have to deal with all the work that's associated with really our next topic here, which is the um, uh, leukopenia that we see so often and that is often uh, where valcite or valgan cycle is often a major contributor. So I think that's really what this gets at. When do we start prophylaxis? When do we discontinue prophylaxis? And I guess we can uh, start with Dr. Dr. Bloom. What are the things you encounter? You're mostly using valgan cyclovir. Uh, whether it's cost or or side effects that makes you uh, have to come off that. So, so two things. We typically uh, our stand. We use uh, pharma, RATG in most of our patients. We use uh, MMF uh, at a 500 milligram twice a day dose. So we don't use higher doses of MMF or, or mycophenolate sodium. Uh, and then we use 450 milligram of Valgan cyclovir for intermediate risk. And I mentioned earlier the high. The 900 milligram um, for the the high risk, and so uh, one thing that we have known in our program, and and um, it, it is a challenge, but for patients that are high risk who develop leukopenia, we never reduce the dose of the antiviral prophylaxis. So 
Um, we may reduce MMF, we may hold MMF, we may increase, you know, TAC or, or, or prednisone even a little bit, but we do not reduce um, the, or if someone's on a steroid withdrawal, we may, or steroid avoidance, we may start him on a bit of prednisone, but we never reduce um, Valgan cycling because of the concern of developing CMV and you basically converting them to a, uh, a preemptive approach um, and you know potentially putting them at risk for CMV and and while I do understand the benefits of potentially getting CMI you have to weigh that up against the indirect risk of having rejection in patients who do um, uh, develop who, who do develop CMV as was shown in that study that I presented so. Uh, when we, in patients who get profoundly lipopenic, we typically resort to using uh, GCSF. Um, it's, we obviously have, we, we're used to it now, but it's, uh, it, yeah, it can be discomforting. And clearly, if we could avoid having leukopenia, there's an advantage to that. Dr. Blumen, on behalf of our, your transplant ID colleagues um, and pharmacists, we, we appreciate you not reducing the dose of Valgan cyclovir, so we, we don't have to get a uh, 4.30 on a Friday drug-resistant CMV, so thank you. Um, uh, I, I know you're not using uh, the Valgan cyclovir as much anymore, so I don't know, Dr. Jorgensen, if you have anything to add to that. Oh, well, certainly, because we don't have 100% you know, coverage through insurance, so patients certainly do need Valgan cyclovir sometimes. And unfortunately, there are some high-risk patients that you know, they're over income for the patient assistance program through Merck. They, their insurance copay is like $6,000, the price of the drug. So in those, you know, we're not going to force them <laughs> to buy it when their Valgan Psychovir is like 300 bucks. Um, so typically, you know, we try to get people at least 90 days. So we're talking pre-impact duration. Um, because of an experience we had with DeNovo PEM in these... Um, high risk patients where it seemed like because of their lymphocyte depletion, uh, they really couldn't mount CMI in the first three months. Uh, so all the replication events, you know, weren't helping them. They were only hurting them. So we tried to get them to three months, at least two months. But if they do become leukopenic at that point, um, we will convert them to high risk PEM with weekly CMV PCRs. Um, we also have started to run into an interesting issue with latirmavir that you don't really see with Valgan cyclovir. So typically you would give six months. Um, and when telling the patient when to stop the drug, you're like, okay, it's June 6th, stop it on December 6th. But latirmavir is dispensed in like a dose pack where you take 28 days. So there were some growing pains with like dispensing it in time so they didn't miss any doses to be on this like every 28 day schedule. And we often in the sick, like after the fifth dispense, we'll call the patient and say, well, you know, how much drug do you have left? We need to figure out exactly when you're going to stop it and cancel the script. You know, there's no point of having any leftover latirmavir lying around. You can't use it for treatment. Um, so best to just finish up the pack and then, you know, do all the tacrolimus adjustment and that sort of thing. So, so yeah, you know, you learn and grow with these new drugs and new protocols. Well, that is a great segue. You mentioned the, the tacro, uh, interaction. Um, maybe you could just, uh, touch on how you manage, uh, that interaction with, we obviously have with latermavir, but do not have to deal with, with Valgan cyclovir. Right. So um, I like to think of latirmavir as more, it's kind of like fluconazole's drug interaction, but it seems to have a, a quicker onset, about three to five days versus a week. Um, so we do an empiric 50% dose reduction when starting latirmavir, um, and then double the dose when stopping the latirmavir. Um, it's a little tricky if you're doing it on the inpatient setting because you know, if you're getting daily tacrolimus levels, uh, you won't necessarily see the full effect for a couple of days. Um, so in that setting, you might want to just monitor. But in the outpatient setting where you're measuring time based in weeks and not days, uh, you definitely want to empirically adjust with its initiation. Now, 
I just want to put in the caveat for my cardiothoracic transplant friends. Um, if the patient is already on very potent CYP mediated drug interaction kind of drugs like posaconazole prophylaxis, it is possible that such an aggressive dose reduction is not required because, you know, at some point you've just saturated those enzymes and you really aren't going to have a bunch more drug interaction happening. So that's a very good pro tip. Um, <laughs> in the interest of time, I'll just mention this um, myself uh, around uh, HSV and VZV um, prophylaxis. And but before I do, I'll make a shout out for Shingrix um, to get your patients. It's it's approved for any adult. They don't have to be over over 50 if they're immunosuppressed or if they're about to become immunosuppressed. And we haven't had troubles at all recently with 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 payment, but that's a great way to prevent some of the varicella zoster that you'll see um, in after immunosuppression. But it's just, we put this in there just to remind people that unlike valgancyclovir, uh, latermivir does not have activity against herpes simplex or varicella zoster virus. So really, uh, you have to add either acyclovir or Valtrex if they're on uh, latermivir. And then cost. So this is this is a, a big one um, uh, uh, regarding the difference between valgancyclovir and latermivir. Dr. Bloom, I don't know if you have any any comments. Dr. Jorgensen had mentioned they do the you know the 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 test prescription uh, and other things early, but whether. Uh, you've had issues with uh, getting latermivir covered. So in the few patients that we've used it in thus far, uh, we have not, but I know that it could be an issue. We've had issues over the years with valgancyclovir. It's it's costly. So um, in general, when we are and we have our financial coordinators try and anticipate these costs prior to the transplant. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Jorgens, I don't know if you had anything else to to add, you know, regarding um, uh, uh, manufacturer programs or other avenues that you've you've used in your patients to help get the term of your covered. Right. So I just want to mention one thing quickly. Um, Valgancyclovir is still quite expensive, um, and the old uh, patient assistance program that used to be available through Genentech has termed. So for the past year, um, you know, that was no longer an option. And actually, that was a really great patient assistance program. It was easy to enroll in and many patients would qualify. Uh, so we sort of started pivoting to latirmavir um, last year when that ended. Um, and I always try to remind coordinators and, you know, the transplant team, if somebody can't afford Valcite, preemptive treatment you know, the PEM approach is not great <laughs> because you have to look at their risk for replication. So if they're high risk and you put them on PEM because they can't afford Valcite, well, are they going to be able to afford treatment dose? Because one in two chance that they're going to need it. And then, you know, the seropositive group in our data, we found that it was about 35%. So you're playing a little roulette with that. I mean, maybe you wouldn't have to buy it when you left the hospital, so you could save some money to for your two hundred dollar prescription. But um, yeah, the cost is really tricky. Um, certainly, taking someone off valcite prophylaxis when they have leukopenia, like sure, we'll use the valcite if we have to. But um, yeah, the cost is tricky, um, and unfortunately, you know, the patient uh, assistance program through Merck is a lot more challenging than the old Genentech for Valcite was. I mean, you have to obtain their income. They have to sign a multi pages of paperwork. Um, they have to bring in a 1040 form that proves their income. They have to send in copies of their insurance card. So it's funny because Merck has a great uh, patient assistance with posaconazole, but for whatever reason, this latirmavir one is a little bit trickier to get access to. So, you know, we started, we have a team that kind of does this investigation of benefits, but uh, the pharmacist actually started taking it into our own hands to get these papers signed and things to try to move the process along because we like to think, you know, this valgan cyclovir exposure puts the patient at risk for some resistance, um, according to the guidelines, any exposure longer than six weeks. So, 
you know, any exposure we can avoid by getting them this alternative agent that can't be used for treatment is worthwhile. And, you know, we don't want them filling the valve site three times and then switching to latirmavir because you've sort of lost that benefit in that case. So all I can say is, you know, a really proactive approach and know that all the work you're doing up front will help you on the back end, but it is a lot of work. Well, thanks so much. That, that was really great practical advice. We have in the uh, the information that's available uh, for uh, our uh, participant, our viewers and participants, um, we have these top 10 commonly asked questions. Many of them go back and reinforce the points that we've already made. So to make sure that we have time for, for questions, we're not going to go through and specifically um, discuss these now, but uh, they are... Um, available. And what we'll do is go ahead and start to um, answer uh, uh, the questions that are uh, asked. So let's take a few of those. Um, Dr. Jorgensen, I'll send the first one to you. Do you have to adjust latermavir if the patient is on Bella? Um, you don't ever any... want to really adjust the latermavir. Um, it would be adjusting the tacrolimus. So the latirmavir dose, I mean, it's a pharmacist's favorite drug. You know, you don't have to renally dose it. The dose is always the same, one pill a day. It's not too big. You know, it's great and all that in that way. Um, with baladicept, I would say uh, if this they're CMV high risk and it's like a, you know, de novo baladicept post-transplant, um, you know, maybe do a little CMV monitoring because we, the only case of latirmavir failure that we've ever seen uh, was in the setting of bilatisept induction with low dose TAC and mycophenolate and PRED, so a quad therapy kind of setting. Um, so you just don't want your prophylaxis to fail when you already have this kind of high risk scenario going on, but... I would just I would just say that um, you know there are there's actually a few studies now that show that belatacept can be associated with quite severe uh, CMV and and refractory to therapy CMV. So not that's not a reason to not use latermavir, but I'm just that I endorse that you need to monitor it close CMV closely in patients who are high. Yeah, risk. high risk. Yeah, yeah. Seropositive. They. I mean, we've had someone on preemptive monitoring, and they'll replicate. And then they come back down. You got to love that pre-transplant immunity. Great, thank you. Um, another question here. You know, we've been focused, and the the clinical trial obviously was limited to high risk donor positive, recipient negative for the the licensure of latermavir, which, if I recall, came like the same day the trial was published, which was kind of amazing. Um, but the question is around moderate risk patients and whether or not you use with permavir for moderate risk patients. And as a side to that, whether there are more challenges for payment since it's technically not FDA approved for uh, moderate risk. Yeah, so far, no. But I am a little concerned. You know, usually in the first six months or so um, after it's approved, it's kind of like a free for all. At least this is what we experienced when it was FDA approved for BMT. Uh, we were able to get it for a lot of people after solid organ transplant because the insurances had not reviewed the formulary yet and created any limitations. So I'm a little concerned in the new year if we might get a lot of denials for the seropositive group. Um, but to date, we've been able to get many seropositive patients on it and it is just dreamy. I mean, you want to get rid of preemptive monitoring for those toxicities. Latirmavir definitely solves that issue. Okay. And, you know, we talked about this one a little bit, um, but maybe to just uh, uh, discuss again, and that's how do you manage viral uh, resistance? Maybe I'll go ahead and take a, a, a quick stab at that and see if others want to add anything, which is one of the nice things now is that in the past, all the drugs we had for CMV basically worked at the level of the of the uh, viral DNA polymerase, right? And so while you didn't always see cross-resistance, you could even get cross-resistance between uh, valgancyclovir, sidofovir, and um 
uh, foscarnet. But the nice thing about whether it's meribavir or uh, latermavir mm -hmm. is they both have different and unique mechanisms of action. So you don't see cross resistance um, between those uh, two agents. So in terms of how we manage viral uh, resistance, what I would say is that the drug that's approved that has FDA approval for resistant or refractory disease is not latermavir, it's meribavir. Uh, and uh, I would say that's an option, but I would also mention that for people with very high levels of viremia um, or very significant end organ disease, you may not get the what you want out of meribavir and you definitely have increased risk of resistance with either meribavir or latermavir. So when we can, we try and use something like foscarnet, which obviously has toxicity issues, to bring down the viral load and then uh, start them on uh, meribavir. Um, I don't know if Dr. Jorgensen or Dr. Bloom if you have any, any comments about that. I know, Dr. Bloom, that's getting to the like, let the ID people deal with that issue. But that's more or less what we do, but I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I certainly... Um... You know, that is an issue near and dear to my heart because the best resistance is no resistance. And I can't say this enough. Like, if you can be proactive, if you can monitor these patients before any problems develop and prevent them from happening, your life is so much easier and their outcomes are so good. So we had a horrible problem with CMV, uh, gancyclovir resistance at the UW. And you know, these patients have very long lengths of stay. Their graphs outcomes are horrible because the drugs are like incredibly toxic, foscarnet. Um, we had someone go blind from sedofavir. I mean, horrible. So throughout the years of like, you know, doing QI and trying to evaluate our stewardship program, we've really tried to drill down to, you know, how can we prevent every bad thing from happening? <laughs> And obviously, you know, you can't prevent everything, but um, I do feel like the proactive approach with the monitoring of the high-risk group, because if you're going to have problems, it's going to be in those patients, your seropositive patients, you know, they have pre-existing immunity, which they can reconstitute, um, but the high-risk people are the ones to keep the eyes on, so. Yeah, and on that note, I'll mention that you know, one of the things that I was most interested in, as I said before, as the the clinical trial of of using latermavir as prophylaxis in high risk patients was, would we see resistance? Because you will see that if you give it to people with resist with already resistant or refractory disease, um, or people who aren't tolerating other agents, and it wasn't observed. It was observed with valgancyclovir, and that was probably because the drug had to be stopped, or maybe probably, I don't doubt it was dose reduced in the clinical trial, um, and you had high levels of replication. So we're getting near the end of the program, uh, and I want to go through um, these uh, goals. So I want to thank the audience for their participation today, and I want to summarize these SMART goals, which stand for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Uh, and so our goals today were to identify the prevalence, burden, and risk associated with CMV and kidney transplant patients, to utilize scientific knowledge and clinical data of both novel and historically used medications in prophylaxis of CMV in patients with kidney transplants, uh, and to implement specialist guidance and perspectives in the development of CMV prophylaxis uh, at your uh, institutions. Uh, and finally, um, to uh, receive credit, you can see uh, that there'll be um, uh, a, a post-test and evaluation online. And uh, I want to thank both Dr. Jorgensen and Dr. Bloom. I really uh, enjoyed uh, learning from both of you and discussing uh, this issue. And again, thank CMV Outfitters for uh, arranging um, this uh, program. And thank you again for joining us um, and be safe and take care. <laughs>